it. Um, we were very lucky here in the geospatial world because we get to make pretty pictures all the time and people like to look at the pictures we make. So that's really cool. So it's actually kind of gives us a leg up to other people who just have to make like box and whisker plots or something like that. We get to make maps. So that's really fun. And today what we're going to talk about this morning is um, just a couple of really useful um, not only packages in Python but also just like p patterns of thought that are going to help you guys bring your geospatial data that we've been working with all week to a level that not only helps you communicate your results to other people and create beautiful artifacts that you can then put into your science and nature papers, uh, but then also allow you to have a set of tools that can help you actually do your work better, right? Because visualization is not merely a way to communicate, but it's also a really excellent way to help you as the thinker think more effectively. And that's actually what we're gonna start with today. So I'm fresh off of a data visualization course here at the University of Washington, taken, by, taken with the Jeffrey here, who's a legend. If any of you have ever written, uh, written JavaScript code, he, his graduate student wrote D3, which is one of the central packages for writing uh, visualizations on the web. And he has a really beautiful conceptualization of data visualization. If you wanna follow along with this, you can please go to GeoHackWeek uh, website slash visualization, in the URL bar up there. Um, and I just picked three really excellent quotes that I think are a really great way to conceptualize the idea of visualization from really mostly old white men. The quotes are, transformation of the symbolic into the geometric. Think about that for a second. Think about the, your favorite data visualization. Taking symbols which are in your brain and making them shapes, right? That's kind of a core tenet of data visualization. The same applies to maps. This one I really like, the next one. Finding the artificial memory that best supports our natural means of perception. What is artificial memory? Does anybody have any idea what that means? Call it out, what do you think? What is an artificial memory assistant? Give me an example of one. Has anyone ever used a calculator? Has anyone ever used a piece of paper? Yeah, those are artificial memory, right? You take things out of your brain and you put them in a tangible form. So that helps you think better, right? Has anyone ever tried to do long division in your head? It's challenging, right? If you write it down, you use a piece of artificial memory, you can do the job better. This is one of the core pieces of data visualization that I really like to think about when I'm building visualizations. How can I make a thing that helps me think better and do less work, right? So data visualization is not just a way to create a pretty map, but it's a way to help you and others think. And the third one is the use of computer-generated interactive visual representations of data to amplify cognition. I think that's a, quite the statement, amplify cognition, right? Make you think better, make you think more powerfully. So I wanted to put these three things in your brains here just to start off with because I, it's really easy in this tutorial to like get really bogged down and like, what's the command line argument? Or like, how do I, what's the coordinate reference system? And there's like, I don't remember. That's fine, and like you can look that stuff up. But what I wanna give you an idea of today is just the notion that visualization is more powerful than just like creating one-off plots in your Jupyter notebook and then like sending them to your advisor or your collaborators and being like, look, I made this plot. They're also a great way to help you do your job and to help you give others the opportunity to understand your process of thinking. So there's a bunch of other bullet points here. Why visualization? Why do we wanna do this? To answer questions or discover them to make decisions, to see data in context. Maps are an excellent version of seeing data in context, right? Someone gives you 10,000 geospatial points. What's the first thing you wanna do? Put them on a map, right? <laughs> You're like, where are they? I'm not, I don't know about you guys, but I can't really look at a pair of latitude and longitude coordinates and be like, that's in, in Georgia. You know, like I, I can't do that. So putting them on a map is one of the first things that I like to do. Um, then expand memory, we already talked about that one. Give you a chance to use your brain more effectively. Support graphical calculation, that's kind of a highbrow one. I copied and pasted this. Uh, find patterns, present, argument, or tell a story, and to inspire, which is the next thing we're gonna do. We're gonna look at a couple of classical geospatial visualizations. This is made by one of the uh, legends of uh, geospatial visualizations, Charles Minard, Frenchman, from a long time ago. This was made in the 1800s, hand drawn. It represents the coal exports from Great Britain. 
What's really cool about this map? Anybody? Call it out. It shows the volume. How does it do that? By the width. Yeah. Very good. Cool. I'm sorry. What did you say over there, Allison? Okay. It actually, uh, it does in that little bar chart over to the right hand side, that stacked line graph, it, it does have a little bit of a temporal element. Yeah, so you really get a lot out of this, right? This is, a, this is a simple map and yet you learn a lot about, I mean, you, if, how else could you present this information? Yeah, as a big table. Would that be fun to look at? No, right, Does it, would a table inspire you? Probably not, right? This is a great way to say, wow, you could, I mean, I get a lot of things from this. Namely, wow, the Great Britain sent their coal all around the world. Like that's not something that a table's gonna tell you, right? Yeah, and also uh, they didn't really have the Panama Canal back then, right? <laughs> Some other interesting things to see there. So that's one example of a geospatial visualization that doesn't require like 200 lines of matplotlib code, right? This is hand drawn. You don't have to be an expert in Python to make beautiful data visualizations. Uh, does anybody have any questions about this map before we move on? Okay. And this one's my favorite. How many of you have seen this before? Yeah, a good number of you. Uh, does anyone want to tell us what this is? Louder. Yeah, <laughs> where'd you read that from? So this is, a, this is a geospatial visualization, believe it or not. This indicates the movement of Napoleon's army in 1812 to Moscow. And it is also a temporal visualization because it shows the change in the army's size over time as they were marching to and from Moscow. What do you notice from this geospatial visualization? The army gets smaller, <laughs> right? Does that happen because of a conflict in Moscow? The temperature graph at the bottom, check that out. Do you guys see there's this temperature graph at the bottom? The bottom line chart is a plot of temperature. Is it warm? It's very cold. This plot was engineered to show why Napoleon's army got so small as they were marching to Moscow. It's because it was really, really cold. That's why a lot of people died. But this is a very clear way to present that picture, right? You could write that out to someone. You could say Napoleon's army got smaller when they went to Moscow because it was cold. But this gives you an idea of just how quickly that happened and just how decimated the army was when they arrived back from where they started. So these are just a couple of really cool um, kind of edgy, weird geospatial visualizations that kind of expand your mind a little bit in the sense that you don't just have to make a map in the Mercator projection, right? You can make geospatial visualizations in a whole bunch of different ways. Questions or comments about the philosophical underpinnings of data visualization? Yes. Ah, yes. Yes, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, so that's a great point in that data visualization can e is an excellent tool for misleading. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Yeah. This is uh, Jeffrey here's, I think it's CSE5, I don't remember the number, data visualization in the uh, graduate computer science department here at the university. Yeah, it was a great class. I highly recommend it if you are a student here at this wonderful institution of higher learning. Okay, so we're gonna jump into some details now. Um, and I wanna talk about something that is really annoying and that no one likes to talk about and that is critical for your understanding of how to make good, accurate geospatial data visualizations here uh, for the rest of your geospatial modeling career. And that is the idea of a projection. Can anyone throw out a, like a 10 word or fewer definition of a, of a projection? That's what I thought. I can't either. <laughs> Nice, very, that is a very mathematical answer, yes. So I wanna talk about, I wanna talk about the Earth for a moment. 
Uh, you can see that I titled this episode, The Earth is Round, and then I put a picture of an orange, right? So one of the principal challenges of making maps is that the Earth is a sphere or an ellipsoid, whatever <coughs> version of this you'd like to believe. Um, and maps that we look at in, in, in our lives are flat. So the challenge, of course, is how to render this spherical ellipsoidal Earth that we live on into a flat plane. That is the challenge that most geospatial, that is the prime challenge of geospatial data visualization. How to move this round thing into a flat thing. This is one example. You draw the Earth on an orange, do your best. I was gonna buy a bunch of oranges for this, but I really thought that would actually get out of hand real quick. Um, draw the Earth on an orange, and then try to make the orange flat. This is known as the good homolysine projection. This is a real thing. If you click on that link, you'll go to the Wikipedia page. It is a mathematical definition. It is not just cutting an orange up at random places, but this orange in particular is projected in the way that the good homosine projection projects the Earth. So it's just kind of a weird way to think about it. There are lots of map projections, a huge number of them. You can read all this text in here. I didn't intend it for you. You can go back and look at it if you want. But I put three examples of map projections down here. You guys are probably familiar with the left one because you've probably all used Google Maps. Right? The web mercator projection is one of the primary projections that Google Maps uses. The middle one you're familiar with even though you don't know it because all the weather maps you've ever looked at are in Lambert conformal. And then the one on the right is the National Geographic projection. They're all simply different ways of taking this spherical Earth that we live on and projecting it to a flat thing. Questions about that? None. No questions. Zero questions. Yes. Good question. Uh, the Mercator is a square for the most part. Not in this image I showed you because I cropped it. But that's a really good. The question was why do web maps like Google and Bing or whatever use the Mercator projection? And the answer is that the Mercator projection is a square. It's the same on both sides. So it makes web programming a lot easier. And you don't have to deal with the complex shapes. Uh, <laughs> so any other questions about uh, projections before we get into some actual writing of code? I'm going to tell you one more thing. Yes, sir. Uh, can you go from a flat thing to a round thing? Yes. They go both ways. Projections at their core are mathematical equations. They take round things and turn them into flat things, and that the way you do that is you apply a bunch of trigonometric identity equations. Um, the one thing I want to mention first before we, before we move forward is that there are, are probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of specific projections for various things. Like, for example, if you were a undersea miner and you were looking for uranium under the ocean in the middle of the Pacific, there's probably a specific map projection for the area in which you and your oil company or your mining company do your drilling. Because you've made it such that you want to have certain assumptions about when you look at your maps, one centimeter is going to be this much area on your map. And that's just what your projection is. And you're not interested in the whole world. You're not interested in mapping the whole world and having certain uh, different things be true about the whole world. You are just interested in your little part of the ocean. And so there are so many projections that a um, organization known as the European Petroleum Survey Group, don't know why it's them, but it happens to be them, they came along and said, you know what, we're going to put numbers on every projection. And so when you refer to a projection, you can refer to it uniquely by its EPSG code. We're going to do that next. OK. Questions about projections? And we're going to do more on projections in a moment. You guys. Um, what I'd like y'all to do now, if you want to follow along, is go to your Jupyter Hub and go to the visualization folder and go to the notebooks folder and click on Cartopie projections. <coughs> We're going to work through this. Um, so I've given you the sort of mental framework for projections, right? They make round things flat. But you now probably want to know, OK, how do I go do that in Python? What are the tools that allow me to do that in Python? And the critical central library for this 
is called Cardo Pi. <coughs> Excuse me. Cardo Pi is a Python package, and it allows you to very easily make your regular plots aware of map projections. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run this top cell because it just makes a little convenience functions for me that I'm going to use later. Um, we're going to ignore all these words. They're in there so you can go read them later. But they're basically what I've just said. One thing that I haven't said yet, though, is that choosing a projection is important. And this has exactly to do with this notion that data visualization can be misleading. Certain projections can make, I don't know, Africa look like the size of Greenland. They're not the same size, right? If you make Africa and Greenland right next to each other and they're the same physical size on a piece of paper, people are going to be like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that Greenland was the size of Africa. It's not, right? But that's a projection problem. You've projected in a misleading way. That doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, right? If you don't, if you don't care if people think that they're the same size, you just want to show their shapes next to each other, it doesn't matter, right? You can write, these are not the same size. That's fine. People will get it. But you have to be aware of which caveats come with your projections. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. So let's ignore all that words. What I'm going to do here um, is I'm going to show you a couple of central pieces to using CardoPy that are, um, that are really, really critical to think about when you're, uh, when you are, oh, wait, is this not the right one? Dang. Yep, that's right. We're going to do this first. Sorry, I jumped the gun there a little bit. I want to show you a couple of paradigms in using Python and using CardoPy that allow you to really get a good handle on how this works. Who's used Matplotlib before to make plots? Yeah, a good number of you. So the code that's on the screen now, do you recognize that? Can someone walk me through what we're doing there, even though I've pretty much told you? Creating a set of axes. Right? That's kind of critical. That's the first step usually to making a lot of plots. Sometimes you do that by saying, plt.subplots. Sometimes you do that by saying plt.figure. There are lots of different ways to instantiate a set of axes. You don't have to worry about that right now. All we're doing is we're creating a new thing to put data on. We're saying, hey, I've got some data, x and y. I'm going to plot it onto that axis as a scatter plot. Each individual pair of data points is a single dot. I'm going to set a title. I'm going to label the x and the y axes, and I'm going to look at it. And there's our plot. Right. Fairly straightforward. Let's say you want to make an equally simple plot in Matplotlib, or rather in CartoPy. You want to make a map. This is the only difference. You import a couple of things. The first import says, hey, CardoPy, I'd like you to tell me about all the coordinate reference systems you know about. Coordinate reference system is the same as a projection. You can think about those interchangeably. Projections and coordinate reference systems are the same idea. We're going to import that package and we're going to say, OK, I also want you to tell me about the land features that you know about and give me some tools for using them in case I want to add maybe some coastlines or some um, underlying data into my map. I'm going to import that. This is the only line that's different. When you create your set of axes, you tell the axes, hey, axes, you are in a very specific projection that I'm telling you about. You are attaching a projection to a set of axes. In this example, we're using the Mercator projection, just like that. And we also say, hey, I want to add a feature. The coastline feature. We'll go through this in a minute in another notebook. I'm going to set a title, and here's your map. Five lines of Python code, you have a world map. The only reason why there's anything plotted on these axes is because I added this add feature line. But if I hadn't, this would just be the Mercator projection without anything in it. Let's say we don't want the Mercator projection. Let's say we just want the Lambert conformal projection. What, what did I change? The first line, right? All I said was, hey, I want the Lambert conformal projection. That's it. And now there it is. What didn't I change? I added the same feature. I didn't reproject it. I didn't load a new shape file. I didn't say, hey, this is in this coordinate reference system. 
because the CardoPy feature library knows about the coordinate reference systems of its reference data. So it knows that the coastline feature is in a certain projection. And the axes know that they are projected into the Lambert conformal projection, so it takes care of the transformation for you. This is the power of Cardify. You don't have to think about your transformations. You just have to tell Cardify what the source data is, what its projection is, and what the plot you desire, what the projection of that is. It will handle the rest. You might imagine this is a powerful tool. We're gonna do a little example here, and I'm not gonna run this because it, oh no, where's the pictures? Oh no, oh God, they're not there, oh. Okay, well we can fix that. Um, we'll just do this one then. So if y'all are in the uh, notebook, I encourage you to uh, move to these, um, these little cells here that we're looking at. And I encourage you to mostly ignore this cell here. All this is doing, and I can walk you through it, is it's saying, hey, I've got a shape file that lives somewhere and I'd like you to read it in. It's not super important that you know how to do this right now because you won't actually do this. This is an old way of doing this because this notebook is from last year. There are better ways now that we're gonna do in a moment. So we'll just run that, we'll load some data. What this does is it says, hey, get me some shapes that represent the states and provinces of the world. This is the part that I wanna talk about here. This line, this, uh, set, this part of the code right here. We're saying, hey, make me a figure I would like it to be 15 by 15, that's inches. Make me a set of axes. I want the projection to be the default projection. I wonder what I set that as. Let's scroll up to the top and we'll see, okay, the default projection is the Google version of the Mercator projection, which I'm getting from Cardo Pi. Yes? Yes, you can, you sure can. Does anyone, okay, we'll do that in just a moment. Um, there's our default projection. This is kind of important. We're gonna set the extent. We're gonna say, okay, well, I, I don't want the whole world. I want just this part of the world. What kind of coordinates are these in? Does anybody know? Are these UTM coordinates? No, what are they? Flat long. long, right? Decimal degrees. So this is critical. You can use set extent in other matplotlib code. You can say, hey, I want my map, I want my plot to have this extent on it, minimum and maximum y, x and y coordinates. But the only difference with Cardopy is you have to tell it, hey, these coordinates are in the geodetic coordinate reference system. That's another way to say they're in the lat long coordinate reference system. If I had decided to write this using UTM coordinates, what I would do instead of geodetic is I would say UTM. And I have to say, oh, it's their UTM 11. And then it would automatically do the transformation for me. And it would say, okay, I know what extent you want because you told me and you told me the coordinate reference system of the data. Question about that. Is there a Good question. A figure can have lots of axes. Does that answer your question? No? Good, good answer. A figure is a container, and you can have axes inside the container. Axes are the kind of the subunit of a larger figure. A f Correct. But you need a figure before you can have axes. That's because Matplotlib is smarter than me, and it knows that if it doesn't have a figure already, and I try to write axes, it'll be like he needs a figure. I'm gonna make him a figure. Yeah. Precisely. Yes, and you can also set other things like I want the the um, the file format to be this, or I want this other parameter of the figure to be this. The reason why I set the figure there is so I could set the size, but it's not necessary. Do we have a question back there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're usually they don't have sub attributes. Usually it's just like the Mercator projection or the Lambert projection or whatever. The Google is a specific subset that a lot of people use of the Mercator, so they added that one in. So how is there a way to set the data to be It is well documented, yes. I can send you a link. We can do that on Slack later. Very good. 
Um, okay, so the next thing we're doing is simply adding a title. And then here's the interesting thing here that we're doing. And this, I, I jumped the gun on this a little bit because again, there's a better way to do this, which I'm gonna show you later. All this is doing is saying, hey, read this shape file, which is on my computer somewhere. Here it is, this, this URL up here. I downloaded it. It's on your Jupyter Hubs as well. Go through that, read it with this package called Shape Reader, which is a part of uh, Cardo Pi. Get me all of the geometries within that. And then for each geometry, add them to the axis. Does everybody see that? Ax.add geometries. All you're doing there is you're saying, hey, Cardo Pi, I want to take this geometry called state, which is one of the geometries inside this shape file, and I would like to add it. And in order for you to add it, you, know, you need to know that it's in the plate car projection, which is another way to talk about latitude and longitude. I'm sorry that I use them interchangeably here, but you could very easily and accurately write this. That'll work. This little function here says, I want a random color for every new geometry. I wrote that little function at the top, you can find it. And then I want the edge color of these to be black. And that's what you get in five lines of code. This is a map. Yeah. Yeah, and that's because it will default, the extent will default to the projection that the axes are in. It's best practice to specify it explicitly, but it will default to the axis projection. Okay, great. So what I wanna do is um, I actually wanna work through an example with you guys because it's one thing to look at these, but it's another thing entirely to um, actually do it. So I'm gonna open up a new notebook and this is gonna be, this is gonna be a little spicy here because we're doing some live coding, but we can, we'll try it out. Um, and I'm actually gonna, what am I gonna do? I think I'm gonna go through, um, I am gonna go through the next example here um, in this, in this uh, episode. Um, but because we had a question about projections just now and which ones are available, I wanted to quickly just scroll through these and then y'all can look at them on your own. Um, so in this notebook, there's a section called predefined projections. And they show you a handful of projections that are possible in uh, Cardify. It is not an extensive list, but there's a bunch of them in here. And I wanted to just demonstrate them. And what I've done is on each of them, I've added what's called the TSO indicatrix. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah, what is it? Yes, it tells you how much aerial distortion a given projection has. So if you look at this map, for example, each of those circles has the same area. So what is this telling you about the, the lambert azimuthal equal area projection? It has a little bit misleading name, but the latitudes are comparable. Yeah. Cool. So a couple of examples here. I want you to guys to be paying attention as I'm scrolling through these, and I know that's not the best way to learn, but as I'm scrolling through these, I just want you to be aware of um, how each individual plot is different from each other, and the answer is that it's really hardly ever different. There's one line in every one that's different. So here we're plotting the, um, oh, this is funny. <laughs> Does anyone see the error that I've made here? Yeah! Trick, I tricked you. Is this the Lambert Esmuthal equal area projection? No, how do you know that? Because right here it says Mercator, yeah. And how do I change the projection? Oh, look at that, it's the Lambert Esmuthal equal area projection. Uh huh, nice, great, great, beautiful. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Good. I, I hadn't intended to run this whole thing, so here we are. But anyway, you can. The point here is that as you scroll through these different projections, this is the Lambert Azimuthal Equal Area Projection. You can see that hey, maybe, maybe the equal areas are not so bad when you look at it from a given perspective. These indicators just give you an idea of what kind of distortion you're looking at. Here's another one: the Albers Equal Area Projection. Those are pretty darn good, right? Except for at the pole when things get pretty weird. Can you say that a little bit louder? Okay, great. Yeah, it could be that there's a missing package in the um, in the environment. We encountered this yesterday and we couldn't fix it. So let me, I'll do that offline. What I wanna do though for, for right now 
is I want to walk through a 0 to 60 example of how to, hey, I have a shape file, and I want to put it on a map. All of the documentation for this is over in the plotting actual things uh, episode, but I'm just going to actually go through it. I'm going to write the code out for you guys, and we're going to do it collaboratively so that you all can see actually how you do this. And I'd encourage you to follow along. If you want to read the instructions on how to do it, you can go to the episode. But I want to do this real quick because I think it's a really powerful way to show just the, the potency of this. OK, so let's say you have a shape file. What's the first thing you want to do if you want to bring it into Python? How do you read it? What toolkit do you guys know? Read shapefile. Call it out. GeoPandas. OK, there it is. If you do an exclamation point and you type ls, you can see what files are in the directory you're in right now. My data is not there. I know that it's up one in the data folder. There you go. Look at all these shape files we have. NPS, DC, there's a list of breweries in there for your perusal. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, OK, I'd like to load the parks data set. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to say geopandas.read file. And I'm going to say, OK, it's back in data. What's in data? I'm going to hit the tab key. It's going to look for me. Oh, I did a bad job. I'm going to write NPS because I know that that's a shapefile. It's actually a folder with some shapefile files inside it. It worked. So what's Parks? Does anybody have a name for the thing that Parks is in GeoPandas? It's a GeoData frame. The way you can tell that is you can just run it. Parks. There it is. It's your geodata frame. Printed it out. If you don't want to see the whole thing, you can run head. Just the first five. So what are these? National parks, yeah. They have their little shape files here. I just want to look at one because it's a pretty large data set. So I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I want Olympic National Park. So I'm going to say parks. What do you guys think about that line of code? What is it doing? Yeah, indexing based on unit name. It says, hey, there's this column, unit name. I'd like you to grab the Olympic thing, the thing that says Olympic. It says, OK. And let's just say, hey, you know what? What are we dealing with here? Huh. <laughs> You're not going to get a plot because we haven't written matplotlib inline. It's one of those things in Jupyter that you just have to remember to do. Does everyone see that? OK. So then we're down here. We run a plot, and there's the Olympic National Park in some random projection. Who knows what? Probably just the geodetic projection. Nothing is unprojected. But that's not very satisfactory to me. Let's say I want to plot this in here. What did I do in the example? I want to plot this in a very particular projection. I want to do the Lambert conformal projection. So what I need to do to myself is I need to set up a set, a set of axes. So first I need matplotlib. Pretty standard line of code there. It's going to be in every single one of your Jupyter notebooks. The next one I'm going to say, OK, well, you know, I need CardoPy. And I need it to tell me about co coordinate reference systems. And I also want CardoPy's okay. feature module which allows you to um, load some, some just kind of pre-baked base maps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, so we're going to load those in. And I'm going to say, OK, well, I want a set of axes. I'm going to make figure first. And I'm going to make the fig size something like 8 by 8 or something like that. I'm going to add for myself an axes. What do I have to do here? The projection. Do Lambert conformal. Sounds like it's a good projection. It's fun on the Olympic Peninsula. It's kind of curvy. 
does anyone have any idea how I might add the geometry from this geo data frame into this plot? How do I do it? From what you've seen already. That's a, that is one way to do it. That way we'll have troubles later. So we won't do it that way, but that's one way to do it. You could say, hey, I want to use the GeoPandas plotting command, and I'm going to um, also sell it. I'm gonna, I want you to plot on these geospatial axes. We're not going to do it that way. We're going to do it more explicitly than that. Because CardoPy has a function called add geometries. The axis has an add geometries function. And we're going to say, OK, well, I've got this thing called Olympic. And inside Olympic, it's got geometry. So let's just see. Let's, let's see what happens if I run that. Oh, no. What is it telling me? This is, this is critical. This is very important that you understand this error. Yes. CardoPy is saying, I don't know the projection of the data that you're giving me, so I can't put it on your map. So what we're going to do is we're just going to say, OK, well, that's fine. CRS equals, it's geodetic, latitude, longitude. And I know that because I know that's the CRS of my data. Let's run that bad boy. Not exactly what we wanted there, huh? <laughs> There's two reasons for this. Reason one is that this is a geometry that has errors in it. And I picked this one for that example because it's gonna, this is going to happen to you. And the second thing is that this is the full extent of the projection. It's the whole thing. We don't really want that. We don't want the full extent of the projection if we're just looking at a small part of the world. So what we're going to do, I'm going to go back here because I wrote it down for myself. Copy this and I'll explain it to you. There's kind of a, a trick to this. This is a set of canonical lines of code that you'll use all the time. And they basically, they ask, and there's a naming issue there because this is called Olympic. This says, hey, Olympic, give me your boundaries of all of the geometries inside of you. In this case, there's only one, but it could be that there are multiple. I want you to give me the geometries of everything that's inside of you. It's called total bounds. And then total bounds, which I'll show you down here, is an array of latitude and longitude coordinates that represent the minimum and maximum x and y coordinates, which in this case are longitude and latitude. We can break that array apart and give it to the set extent function. We just have to reorder it a little bit. You can look up the documentation for that. And we're going to set our extent. So it works. But notice that the, the geometry, or the rather the shape of the plot is different, right? That's kind of what we wanted to show there, is that the shape of the plot is different. We're not only, we're no longer looking at the whole world. And you can confirm this by saying axe.gridlines. And then you can say draw labels is true. When you say draw labels is true, it's going to complain at you because it's going to say, you can't actually draw labels on a plot that's not the Mercator plot. So we'll delete that. But you can see that there, is our, there are our grid lines. And if you take away the bounds, you can see that it is going to be considerably larger. Grid lines take a long time to draw on this large map, but there they are. So you can see that we're looking at a completely different part of the or subset of the plot. And this actually didn't happen to me earlier, so this might be because this is the wrong uh, projection. No, that's weird. Um, so strangely, something seems to have gone on with this, um, this shape file, and I don't quite know why that happened. Um, because indeed, that is the sort of thing that worked yesterday. And so one of the things that may be going on here with this um, Olympic geometry is that, um, yeah, that's weird, huh?
Yeah. Sure. Right. So this is actually this is bizarre because um, this may be a version issue. I ran this on a different version of Cardify. So we'll we'll do this example in the Mercator projection just because uh, that's what works here. This is yet another example of how open source software sometimes screws you because people make changes in between versions and you just don't know why they break and here we are. So we'll use the Mercator projection for this example. It's going to be the same. So there's the there this this is this is what we were shooting for, right? This is the this is the Mercator projection of our of Olympic National Park. It was, it was fairly simple, straightforward to make that happen, right? Not very difficult. But let's say you wanted to do something a little more interesting. I'm going to copy this. I want to add some context. I want to say, maybe add some coastline. Inside the CardoPy feature, I'll just show you this. Inside CardoPy feature, which I've imported, if you hit tab here, you'll see, oh, there's all sorts of interesting things in there. It's got coastline, it's got borders, and then there's all these other functions, lakes, land, ocean. These are kind of just built in for you to add really quickly to one-off plots. So you can say, okay, well, it's, let's say, I'm gonna go up here and say, I'm gonna add a feature from the CardoPy features library, and it's gonna be coastline. Anyone see what's different there? There's a couple of very low resolution coastlines here. That's not super satisfactory for me. And so this is something that I really wanted to drive home on this, is that you can use CardoPy to very easily access a huge wealth of um, geospatial data that's freely available online. Yes? Correct. Yeah. Right. You only add a feature if you've explicitly used the CardoPy feature library to generate it. So if you have one of the coastline features from CardoPy feature, or if you use the internals of CardoPy feature to produce a geometry, which we're about to do, then you can then you can use CardoPy to add feature. If you have a geometry that's your own and it's loaded in a GeoPandas data frame or something like that, it's a shapely object. It has a geometric format that is a shapely object, which is the native one inside GeoPandas. It will um, need add geometries and not add feature. Add feature is a CardoPy CardoPy specific thing. Add geometries is sort of meant for a general use. <coughs> and so what we're going to do here is we're going to use this function here called Natural Earth Features. Does anyone know about the Natural Earth data set? Yeah, some of you. Natural Earth is just a freely available online data source which allows you to easily access very high resolution um, cultural and physical boundaries that are on the surface of the earth. Things like countries, things like coastlines, things like um, lakes, things like uh, ocean boundaries, all sorts of things. It's a very useful data set. And because of that, CardoPy provides an interface for the Natural Earth feature data set. And it's called Natural Earth Features. We have to give it a couple of parameters. These are documented fairly well in the, um, in the example that I gave you in the text. So I'm not going to um, tell you how to find these things because they're in there. But I'll just tell you that you have to give a category, a name, a scale. That's really all this needs to, to identify a data set. The category of the data set that I want to add is physical. Because the name of it is land, I want to add the land extent on the world. I want to download the 10 meter version. There are usually 10 meter, 50 meter, and 110 meter scales. 10 meter is the finest, 50 is in the middle, and 110 is the least fine. The one you're looking at above and the coastlines plot that we have is the 110 meter scale. So I want a little bit finer than that. And then I'm just doing a couple of additional things here. I'm saying, okay, well, I'd like you to take this colors um, dictionary that lives inside um, the CardoPy feature package and just pull out, pull out the land color, set it as the face color, and then set the opacity at 0.5. And so if you take this little nubbin of code here, you put it up in our, actually let me just copy this and bring it down. Put that little nubbin of code there and you bring up the rest of your plotting code. Just running this, is the, is the data going to show up on our plot? Is the plot going to look any different? if I just run this cell right now. Why? We haven't added it. So let's take away this one. And we'll say feature land. Um, correct, yeah, sort of totally. 
Because we've used the cardopy feature package to generate it. So it knows it. Exactly. Okay. So it knows a lot about itself. So if you scroll down here, hey, that very light yellow color is that shapefile that was just downloaded from the Natural Earth data set, and it represents the landform that we here in the Pacific Northwest call the Olympic Peninsula. You all see that? Okay, so let's say we want to add actually, let's say we want to do something other than geometry. Let's say we want to actually add a little bit of context. Let's say I want you to, I want to tell you where Mount Olympus is. Let's say I want to tell you where Mount Olympus is. If you were just making a regular plot in Matplotlib, does anyone know what the command would be for just adding a point to end to a random set of axes? Just say you have a point. Yeah. So, so there's there's a couple of ways you can do it, and the way, reason why I'm illustrating this is that. The beauty of Cardopy is that any feature of Matplotlib that you're familiar with, you can use in a geospatial plot. For example, you can use axe.scatter if you want to make a scatter plot. A geospatial scatter plot is the same thing as plotting a bunch of points, where your x and your y coordinates are geospatial. So if you go back to our to this tutorial that I've written here and you go and you find this line here, copy these two actually. I'll walk through this here. Axe.scatter is a matplotlib command. It is a command that you could use in any other plotting context whether or not you were plotting map data or not. It just says I want to put a point on the axes. What kind of coordinates are these? Does anyone know? UTM coordinates, yeah. And how do you know that? Because I've said, hey, Matplotlib, you need to know that in order to plot this data, you need to use what's called a transform. Now this is confusing, because before it was called CRS, and I acknowledge that that's confusing, and I wish I understood why they did it that way. But the reason why they did it that way, I think, is because there are other kinds of transformations you can do to Matplotlib plots that have nothing to do with geospatial, and they just wanted to keep that c convention. But basically all it's saying is, hey, I'm giving you some data, and you need to use a particular form to transform them into the kind of data that we're gonna actually use to plot. And so what we're saying here is, hey, the data is in UTM-10. It's almost exactly the same as what we did earlier. I'm gonna say it's red. So what is this line, what is this line doing here, the top line? What kind of thing is that gonna add to our map? It's going to add a point. And then what do you think this thing is going to add here? The next line. Yeah, some text, right? It's really not that difficult. <laughs> it's fairly straightforward. If you've ever plotted in Matplotlib before, these are very similar commands. And if you haven't, it sort of makes a little bit of intuitive sense. A scatter plot's a bunch of points. Text, fairly straightforward. Similarly here though, notice that we still had to say, hey, these points are in the UTM-10 coordinate system. Very important. So if we take this code here, copy it, run it down here with those two additional things, you'll see that something weird happened. <laughs> Mount Olympus is plotted, but the point's not there. The reason for that is that Matplotlib has an arbitrary bug where it will stack things as randomly as it decides to in Cardopy, and I don't know why this is. <laughs> you have to screw around with this to get them to really show up in the way you want, which is just yet another example of how Cardopy can be beautiful and terrible at the same time. But this is actually a good learning opportunity because I wanna show you how you can, let's say we wanted to turn our geometry the Olympic National Park geometry into something other than a uh, something other than a filled-in polygon. Let's say we just want the outline of the park. Let's say we were plotting some data, and all I want is the outline. In the Add Geometries line up here, where we add the geometry of the Olympic National Park, we can add an additional element to this function, and we can write face color. 
then we can say none. And then we might want to say edge color. We might want to say purple, for example. So there we are. So I don't know why that happened. Can't explain it. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I have spent, that was, uh, somebody over here said, I would spend a day on that. And uh, I have spent days on this. And this is why Cardo Pi, we, we struggle to decide whether or not to keep this, because it's a beautifully powerful library. This is like GIS quality, right? This is a beautiful map that you can export in many formats. You can put in your papers. It's, a, it's very customizable. You can add a, a infinite things to it. You could add model output to this. You can use any function that you're familiar with plotting in matplotlib using this library. But there are just some weird things that take a lot of fiddling around to get right. And so that's kind of, it makes it a very powerful tool that's really useful to know. But it's really hard to access when you're first learning Python, especially. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't have an answer to that question. When is it a bug, not a feature? I don't know. But so anyway, this is what I wanted to show you guys here. It's just this process of getting from a shapefile to an actual plot that you can then export and put in some place. Um, again, same thing. What if I wanted to change the projection on this? Let's say some editor said, hey, we don't use the Mercator projection in our journal. All you have to do is change that top line. Let's try the Albers equal area projection, perhaps. another good example of how Python does a lot of work for you under the hood. And what that means is that as soon as you change some large abstract thing, it has to go and figure out what you meant by that. And so what it's doing behind the scenes here is reprojecting all of the things into a different projection. That's the Albers equal area projection. Nice, huh? Yeah. But notice how Mount Olympus is actually still readable. You can still lot side to side. It's because matplotlib knows that you actually probably want to read it and not have it be the same axis as the projection. So again, just some really quick example of how you can do some plotting uh, in Cardopy. If you want more details, please do run through this example, uh, this, this notebook. We didn't have time to do it today because we were a little short on time this year. But I would really encourage you to run through this because it's fairly, fairly comprehensive. And if it doesn't run on your computer, we'll figure that out. But um, it's a really good way to learn. Does anyone have any final questions about Cardopy that are easy to answer in two minutes? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It does. Have you ever plotted a raster using matplotlib before? How have you done it? Yeah. It's the same, except all of your functions have one additional argument, and that's their coordinate reference system. You can change their opacity. Cardopy is a fully featured GIS, basically, is what it is. But it doesn't look like that because it has like infinite depth, and it's really hard to like get your mind around what it can do. But for the most part, if there's a task that you're wondering if it's possible, Cardopy has a way to do it and to maintain cartographic integrity to say that my data is in this is in this CRS, my plot is in this CRS, and I'm going to put them on a map. Don't care how we're going to make it work because it knows the coordinate reference systems of your data and the plot. Any other questions? I'm going to breeze through this one real quick. We have a little bit of time. OK, so we earlier talked about static maps, right? Like stuff that you would put in a brochure or a paper or a poster or something like that. We were just making those. But what I want to do now really quickly is to show you some tools to make maps that are actually clickable. You can move them around. Because that is how um, one of the fundamental tenets of data visualization for me, which is augmenting cognition, I really have a hard time making a static map and then just like looking at it and really getting too much out of it. I kind of want to zoom around and click on it and drag it around. Maybe that's just because I grew up with Google Maps. Who knows? But like, it's really hard for me to access geospatial data intuitively if I can't actually interact with it. So there's a good number of packages available in Python for that. And the one I'm going to go through briefly today um, is called Folium. Has anyone familiar, I know one or two of you here are familiar with the JavaScript library called Leaflet. Has anyone ever heard of that before? Some of you. Folium is a Python wrapper around this JavaScript mapping library called Leaflet. 
And what that means is that if you want to create a map using Folium, you can export it to an HTML file, put that on some web server somewhere, and then other people can use your little map. It's pretty cool. It's a open web standard. Um, so in this, uh, in this interactive map portion of this tutorial, there's a link down here. You can click that, it'll show you the code, or you can go to your, uh, your Jupyter Hub and click on Folium tutorial. This is similarly deeply documented from last year. And we'll just kind of run through these. Okay. As with anything in Python, we have to import it. What's slightly different about Folium from Cardopy is that instead of setting an extent, you actually just have to tell it where you want the center to be. So I want the center to be somewhere here. I documented that, that's Mount Rainier. So we set the center to a variable. And then I say, hey, Folium, I want a map. Can I have a map, please? Here's the center. Zoom start just says, hey, what zoom level do you want to be at? 15 is super zoomed in, one is the whole globe. I decided six, up to you. We'll run that. And because I had m.save here, it's saving that to an HTML file. And if you want, you can click this link in your notebook and there we are. This is a map centered on Mount Rainier at zoom level six. Just, just like that. However, if you don't save it, and you just leave, you just run that last, so you just actually show what's inside this variable m, which is the map, it will actually render right here in your Jupyter notebook. Pretty slick. So, but that's great, so we got a map here. It zooms around, we can zoom in, we can zoom out. It's pretty fun. Let's say we wanna actually do something with that. Let's say we don't like zoom level six, we can change it to zoom level 10. All right, now we can see the National Park, that's more helpful. I think we're getting closer there, right? Okay, it's fine. This is where things differ fairly significantly from Cardopy, and I wanna, I wanna make you guys aware of this because it's really important. Folium, if you go to its documentation, tells you that there is a bunch of things that you can put on the map. There are markers, there are polygons, there are lines, there are circles, there are all sorts of other icons that you can add if you so choose. The intent is to replicate the experience of using any other web mapping tool. So for example, when you go onto Google Maps and you put in a thing, you know how it shows the little red bubble? on the thing that you flip searched for, little red bubble. That's called a marker. Folium says, hey, we think you're gonna wanna add a marker, so we made a thing called marker, and it allows you to put a thing on a map and show a marker. What's different about this line? What's missing from some, something that I really harped on in Cardopy? What don't we have to tell Folium about? The projection. Folium doesn't need to know about the projection. That's because Folium can only project in the Mercator projection and it can only take latitude and longitude coordinates. That applies to your geometries as well. You have to do the reprojecting, which is a little frustrating. Um, so what we do here is we just create this marker. We give it its location, latitude and longitude. We say, hey, when I click on it, I'd like the pop-up to say camp here. And I wanna add that to my map. This is also different from previously Cardopy. Cardopy, we had this thing called an axis and we added things to that. This time, we create the marker and then the marker has a function called add to and it says, what would you like to add me to? And you give the map object, which we created up here. And we can look at it. Can we click on this? Camp here. Fairly straightforward. We can add a couple more here, just for fun. Notice how I didn't have to make a new map here. I can use the same old map. Add them. This one is a place called Paradise on Mount Rainier. Here's maybe the summit. On this marker, I said, hey, I'm going to add this additional thing called icon. I'm gonna pull down an icon that says, a thumbs up. This one's gonna have home. Got two more markers on our map. 
This is how you plot points with volume. But let's say you want to do something a little more interesting. I went and pulled down a GPS track for the Disappointment Cleaver route on Mount Rainier. Has anyone ever climbed Mountain Rainier? No? Disappointment Cleaver route's the way to go. I went and found somebody's GPS track for that, put it in a shape file. I'm using GeoPandas to read the file. Pretty straightforward, standard, standard business. Yes? So is that um, using the Excel directory or the Excel? Correct. So shape files you can consider to be individual shape files or the whole directory containing all four or five files that a shape file is made up of. Shape files are not just one file, they're actually four or five. It will ignore them. It will ignore them. It just has, it has a couple of values. Yes, correct. So shapefiles, and we can go over this in more detail later. If you have a shapefile called dc underscore shp, it's looking for dc underscore shp dot shp dot prj, all the rest of it. It has to be the same name, and it's looking for a set of um, predefined files. This is equivalent, in fact, to writing That, that might work. I'm not going to do it. Actually, I will. What the heck? Yeah, it didn't work. Okay. Let's just forget about it. I forget what I called it, but it'll work. Okay. So what I did here is I said, I'm going to load this shape file into GeoPandas. This is the weird thing. Folium can only take GeoJSON. GeoJSON is just another vector format. But thankfully, GeoPandas is smart, and it knows how to turn things into JSON, because it knows that lots of things like JSON. So you can say, hey, I want to take my GeoPandas data frame, and I'd like to turn it into a JSON thing. I'm going to pass that to the folium.features.geojson function, and I'm going to add it. I'm going to add a pop-up to it. <coughs> There's this thing in Folium called add child. You can look that up. Basically, it just says, I want to add another element to this element that I'm making. It's going to be a little pop-up. And then that little thing that I've just made, I'm going to add the whole thing to the map. And when you scroll down, suddenly, that's the Disappointment Cleaver route on Mount Rainier, which starts at Paradise, goes to Camp Muir, and ends at the summit. Okay. I'm not going to go through the rest of this because we are on limited time and I want to show you some other cool things. But the rest of this kind of just goes through some additional features of Folium, how to add more than one geometry, how to change the base map. I'll just run this one because it's kind of fun. There's all these different base maps you can run with Folium if you want it to look like you're, I don't know, in a operations center, something like that. Uh, all sorts of cool stuff going on here and you can run through these examples if you want to. There is no need to right now because we're going to go do something slightly different. I'm going to stop here. But there's all sorts of cool stuff in here and it's documented, hopefully well enough, um, so that y'all can have positive experiences learning. Um, but what I want to do finally is talk about other things you can do. Because maybe at this point you're like, dang, Cardopie seems hard. Folium is weird. I don't really want to do this. I just want to use something I can click on. And that's fine, honestly. Like this is a choose your own adventure kind of thing, as is life. So. If Cardify is something that's a little intimidating or not that interesting to you, you don't find it useful. There are lots of other ways in which you can plot data. And I wanted to show one of my favorites. And then I wanted to show one that can do an incredibly powerful amount of data processing in Python that requires a lot of technical knowledge. But when you get it to work, it will blow your mind. Those are the two things you can look forward to in the next five minutes. The first thing is this software program called Tableau. Has anyone ever used Tableau before? Yeah, what, is, what have you guys used Tableau for? Not sure. Pairing maps with charts. Building dashboards. Building dashboards. So Tableau is a business intelligence software tool. That's what it was designed for. It was designed to allow big corporations to plot all their sales data and make more money. But it's also a really potent data visualization tool that was actually developed uh, as an academic project. And then it was turned into a company. But the purpose is to create really beautiful data aware visualizations that can be mixed and matched in a graphical user interface. So for a separate project recently, I created a data visualization about the history of American wilderness designation. This took 20 minutes. I kid you not. 
Now I've been using Tableau for a little bit, but this would have taken a hilarious amount of time in map in um, in Python, and I it wouldn't be interactive. If it would be interactive, it probably would have taken me a week in Python. This is hard stuff to do in Python. But in this plot, what we have here is we have a shape file of all of the American wildernesses. And then down here, we have a chart that shows the total area of American wilderness over time. Each bubble represents a year of designation and how many acres were added that year. So let's say, hey, wow, something weird happened in 1984. 190 new wilderness areas were added. Which ones were they? We'll click that. Oh, there they are. All right. Let's say, wow, what's this one? I've never heard of that one before. Oh, it's the Abaroska Beartooth Wilderness. I'd like to know more information about that. Let me click on it. And then sometimes it opens a new window, sometimes it doesn't. There it goes. Oh, wow, a website that tells me about that wilderness area. Isn't that fun? I kid you not, 20 minutes, folks. Fairly straightforward and really powerful. So I'd really highly recommend that you look at Tableau for easy access data visualization tasks when you first get a new data set. Like if someone says to you, hey, here's some new data. It's got shape files, there may be points. Take a look at it, especially if it's in tabular format or a shape file or something like that. Because you can easily drag and drop plots and say, show me the average area of all these ones in this particular area. Or hey, let's say I wanna you know, I'm really curious about the Alaska wilderness area, so I'll go ahead and select these. Oh, that part doesn't work. No, well, never mind. You can add all sorts of interactive features to the map if you so choose to. Um, and so this is just kind of a, a fun example of how one can use uh, this, this tool um, to assist you in your geospatial data visualization. Um, especially, not least, because as academics, we get this for free. If you are a non-academic, unfortunately this costs thousands of dollars. But because you're an academic, this is something you can use for free. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say the second part of your question? Can you use that visualization? You sure cannot. No, sir. Uh, in Tableau, the data is always latitude and longitude and the projection is always web mercator. No. <laughs> so that's a great example is that Tableau, for all its beauty and ease, is not a GIS, right? It can't hold up to the same cartographic rigor that CartoPy can or that other packages might be able to. But it is a great way to say, show me where my data is or give me something that I can give to a client or the public or some public outreach thing that I'm doing. Like it's a great way to communicate to a wide audience. And in fact, if you notice, on the website that I posted, or the tutorial website, it's embedded here. You can actually use this data visualization that's in this web page here. You can embed them into web pages if they run very slowly, especially with lots of data, but you can do it. Python, or sorry, um, Tableau, completely independent of Jupyter. It's a software program that runs on your desktop and I have it maximized here, but it looks like this. It's just a software program that runs on your computer. And so what, and the way this works, just for a little bit of a under the hood example, is that you build all the individual components of these plots. So here's the designations by year plot. I made that separately. Over here is all the little data things that are inside your shapefile. You can join shapefiles with other data. You can join shapefiles with databases. You can join shape files with tabular data. Tableau's really good at doing joins. And you can drag and drop things. Let's say instead of, I don't wanna change this, it'll screw the whole thing up. But let's say instead of one thing, I wanted another thing, you literally just go ahead and drag it in. Let's just try it, what the heck. Okay, this is uh, shape by year. I don't even know what that means. But you can do things like that. You can explore your data very easily. Um, and so that's, uh, yeah, maybe we could do, I don't know, unit acreage, oh, I already have that one. Total acreage, don't know what that means. Yep, not sure what any of this means, but uh, you can do very easy drag and dropping of uh, your data in Tableau. You make, and then here's the map, very similar, latitude and longitude from my data. I've added all these things to the little tool tip that comes up when you um, pull it in. 
And this is actually four data sources. This is the National uh, Wilderness Areas shapefile, and then it's also a text file containing the information about the, um, about the wilderness areas. And in the data source section of Tableau, you're not supposed to remember any of this, but basically you can say, hey, I want you to join this shapefile I have with this text file I have. And I'm gonna tell you how to do that. Name and agency. So very easy, very graphical. You don't have to write a single line of code. However, there is a Python API for Tableau if you're interested. Um, so Tableau is cool if you're an academic. I'm sorry if you're not, because it's gonna cost you a lot of money. Um, and then the final thing that I wanted to show and just mention very briefly is that there, for, for those of you who are fairly experienced in Python and who have a huge amount of geospatial data, you should be aware of a set of packages called hollow views, geo views, and data shader. There's an example in one of these links where you can access a interactive plot of one billion points and it slides around like it's nothing. That's not something that any of the Python packages I can show you that can do. Once you add like more than a thousand points to Folium, it becomes an incredibly unpleasant experience. There's a billion points in this global map and it runs very quickly because it's exposed to a lot of geo, uh, geospatial processing and also parallel processing tools that are built into this plotting framework. So that if that's something you're thinking about, I would really highly, um, want, I would highly look into uh, data shader and geo views. I just wanted to touch on that briefly because Y'all should know about it if you don't, you have that kind of data. So in the final three minutes, I wanted to ask what people haven't learned about yet to communicate about that. So that if people are like, man, I was really hoping to get an understanding of this thing and we haven't talked about that because I wanna make myself available afterward so you can ask those questions. And maybe there are other people who have those things too. So are there anything that we didn't cover in this tutorial that you were really like, man, I would really like to learn about that? Yeah. Okay, sure, yeah. We can talk about that after for sure. Uh -huh. You just said that you were showing the interlocking of the different data that was that was in this list of right. agencies and like the graph of the you know, 10,000 or whatever. Right, so yeah. Like yeah, and I can touch on that very briefly. CardoPy will take a long time to render your plots, but you will get one. It will just take a long time. Folium is not necessarily the package for huge data. It's a good way to see like broad brush interactive data exploration. Not, not necessarily good for huge amounts of data. I think 20,000 points is, is right at the upper end of where it's anywhere near reasonable. But at that scale, using something like GeoViews is a, is a really good option because it's really good at that. Yeah. Yeah, so Matplotlib and GeoViews, these two examples that I talked about, which are Python code, they can export in a whole variety of image formats, in SVG, GeoTIFF, TIFF, PNG, JPEG, all these, whatever you want. Yeah. Other things you wish that I talked about? Wow, must have really nailed it. <laughs> yeah. All right, any final questions before we go get coffee? 10, 15? Okay, that we good? Let's thank Tony for a great tutorial.